today we got a really special show. We are talking to a Fortune 500 CEO who is going all in on Jacksonville real estate. We're going to talk about how you decide what the courting process is like when you're building a $150 million headquarters and what downtown Jacksonville needs to really attract more talent like this. We are officially live on Facebook for the Tuesday edition of the Not Your Average Investor Show. Today, we've got a very, very special show. So if you are here to learn more about rental income properties in Jacksonville, Florida, you are in the right place. If you're here to get an edge on the Jacksonville real estate marketing because you're a real estate professional and maybe looking for some extra opportunities to bring your clients more income, you're in the right place. And if you're here because you want to find out about the best in-class property management in the world in Jacksonville, you're in the right place. I am your host, Pablo Gonzalez. With me, as always, the guy that we call GC because he generates cash flows, because he's got genius concepts, because he's a great co-host, and because his name is Greg Cohen. Say hello, Greg. Hello, everybody. Great to be with you. And the star of the show today, it is not every day that you get to talk to a titan in industry, a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. They only make 500 of them in the world. There you go. And, and he has decided to grow roots and build a $150 million corporate headquarters for fintech, a category that is a growing, emerging market, getting more and more important to our daily lives. Welcome to the show, Mr. Gary Norcross. Gary, it is an honor to have you here. Oh, Pablo, you're being too kind, Greg. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I look forward to spending the next hour and in, in talking about Jacksonville and why we've selected Jacksonville. So looking forward to participating. Gary, a brother in, in the GC vernacular as well. There you go, right? Yeah, yeah. He's got he's got the G. He's got the G going for him, which is really nice. <laughs> which is really nice. And I want to welcome our community. We already got John Henning in here. Good afternoon, John. We got Andrew Barnhill. He's back. We got Marilyn Cotterman from Homosassa, Florida. Home of the manatees. We got Victor Colazzo. Good afternoon from West Palm Beach. Victor, that's a, that's a new name, I think, that, that, that we don't recognize. Good to have you on the show. Bill Shields, buenas tardes, amigos. Bill, Bill has been going hard at this like bilingual thing that he's got going on. I think it's to make me feel more comfortable. Eddie Harris from Hotlanta. Good to see you, Eddie. And it's glad to have the Not Your Average Investor Show family in the house for this very, very special episode. As you all know, if you've been here before, Hetty Pritchard, good to, good to, I recognize your name. Good to have you back. Dennis J Jaeger from Long Island, New York. Welcome back, Dennis, as well. And for the Not Your Average Investor Show family that comes here all the time, you know that this is an interactive show. You know that we want you chatting with us, chatting with each other. You come here to learn about real estate. You come here to get educated. You come here to uh, pick the brain of a titan of industry here. The next place to go if you want to take your next step in your real estate journey is chat with jwb.com and you'll just book a call, hop on, hop on with the team, value added call. You're going to have a great time and we're about to have a great time here. Gary, I guess the first question that I would love to ask you is how do you become CEO of a Fortune 500 company? <laughs> how does that happen, man? Well, look, I mean, I don't think you ever join a company and think you're going to, you, you think you're going to necessarily get to CEO. I mean, when I talk to everybody that joins the company, I always urge everybody who joins FIS, uh, you know, and I urge them, I hope this is the very last company they ever join, but not necessarily their last job. And so I think it's all just about, you know, career focus. What are the objectives you have for the next, you know, three to five years? Are you attaining those objectives? I was fortunate enough early on to get some great mentorship and really challenge myself to move around the company and really broaden my strengths. And so when that opportunity presented itself to, to actually get to CEO, obviously I was well positioned for that and taking on more and more increasing responsibilities. And, you know, here I sit 33 years later. So I just, it just really worked out well from that view. You know, in 33 years, I, I, I would love for you to tell us the breadth of FIS and, and, and what it does and just kind of set a baseline for your services. We know it's in fintech. I, I have to assume that 30 years ago when you joined the company, fintech was a very different thing than it is yeah. now. And it's, and it's rapidly evolved, right? Yeah, it really, it really has. I mean, you know, if you, if you back up 33 years, we were what we would consider a monoline company, meaning we had a single product for a single function within financial services. And 
fast forward today, I mean, most people don't realize everything FIS does. And uh, even though we're based in, in Jacksonville, I mean, we're a, you know, we're actually a Fortune 200 company today. We're going to do 14 billion in revenue. Really, whether you're looking at the way people pay, the way people bank, the way people invest, we have number one or number two market share in every category. So you think about, let's put it in real life, simple terms. If you're online and you're shopping online, or if you walk into any merchant and you swipe a credit or debit card, or you tap or whatever means you want to pay using your wallet, we're the largest merchant acquirer in the world today. We're operating across all of FIS in 110 countries. We're based in 40 countries around the world. We have more than 75,000 employees, but then you move over into financial institutions and you think about how you bank today, whether you have deposit accounts, your, your show's focused on real estate. So you provide lending and sourcing to fund that real estate purchase today. We do all. We do 34% of all the consumer debt in the U.S. We do 25% of all the deposit accounts, you know, and then you, that just gets much broader as you go international. And then when you think about capital markets, which is trading platforms, derivatives platforms, in any of those categories, which obviously capital markets is kind of the key to keeping overall commerce moving, and all of this moves together in a very horizontal, horizontal, vertical integration, but we're number one and number two in all the capital markets functions as well. So we didn't get here overnight. I mean, we started as one product in one category, but the industry's changed so much, whether it's large corporates, consumers, everybody's push for more seamless integration of financial services experience. And that's allowed us to grow now to more than 800 products delivering against that. And we're all headquartered just right here in, in Jacksonville. Wow. I mean, Gary, I, I don't even know where I start with a question. W with everything that you just walked us through there, I mean, just the, the sheer size of those numbers is, is astounding when we're talking about $14, million, $14 billion of, of revenue there. Um, yeah, I mean, today it's, it's surprising. People don't realize when we move over $10 trillion as a company, right? So, I mean, if you look at just even the global GDP, that's a huge percentage of total dollars moved in the world. And uh, I like to say all the time, we're kind of the wow. best unknown company based here in Jacksonville. So that's kind of how I feel, Gary, right? Like, you know, and I'm a student of the market here in Jacksonville, right? Our company is, has been here from the beginning. That's where we put all of our investment dollars and the investment dollars, dollars, of, dollars of our clients. And I talk about our three Fortune 500 companies here and I talk about FIS, but if somebody actually asked me, what does FIS do? I, I, I struggle, right? It's interesting that you have this incredible breadth of services. You're in pretty much in touch with every single transaction, but it's a little bit, it's, it's been hard to put my finger on it. So I'm, I'm super excited to learn more about FIS, but I'm also really interested in the relationship with Jacksonville mm -hmm. and you have such a long relationship with Jacksonville. Could you kind of tie together FIS and Jacksonville and kind of where that beautiful marriage started and, and really what it is? Yeah, look, when when we when you look back over the history of our company, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary uh, a couple of years ago. And, and, you know, obviously we're we're challenged as a team to make sure we're a company that's going to be here for another 50 years. But when we realize financial services and really the way to what people now call financial technology and the way that was going to transform, we, we realized that we were going to need to continue to build and also acquire capabilities anticipation of our clients' needs. And so the way we got exposed to Jacksonville was we originally bought a mortgage processor here called Computer Power. And, you know, they was founded right here in Jacksonville, Florida, and it was a phenomenal acquisition for us. And as, as you might know, over the years, not only we grow CPI, and bring it into overall FIS, we then later IPO'd that company in what's now known as Black Knight. And obviously Black Knight's another Fortune 500 company based right here in, in Jacksonville, totally unrelated for FIS, but also very close in many ways sister company just due to our heritage. So that originally exposed us to Jacksonville. You know, how did we move, end up moving our headquarters? Because even when we bought computer power at that point in time, we were actually based in Little Rock, Arkansas. And oh, so really? it really backs up to an, another large acquisition that we did in combination. 
when we originally merged with a company called Fidelity National Financial. And at that time, Fidelity National Financial was based in California. And what you realize in all these large combinations and, and, and these large Fortune uh, 500 companies, they have a lot of alternatives and decisions on where to place the headquarters. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point in time that the state of Florida and Jacksonville community actually reached out to the current CEO at that time and said, you know, look, congratulations on the combination. Hopefully it won't cost us any jobs in the state. And then there was a conversation that ensued and it ended up building out the state tremendously. We actually moved the headquarters. Fidelity National was based in California. At that point in time, our company was called Alltel Information Services. We were based in Little Rock, Arkansas. We moved two corporate headquarters. And today you look at, you know, you got Black Knight, you got FNF, and you got FIS all headquartered here just off that one transaction. But then you look across the state and you look at FIS, we've grown our population today to well over 1,200 people in Jacksonville. We have well over 1,000 people in Orlando. We have more than 2,000 people in St. Pete. So if you look at the combination of what it meant for the state, we brought you know more than 4,000, almost 5,000 jobs to the state. So those kind of conversations, you know, in hindsight, you can't trivialize how much they matter to the ongoing position. And so that's how we got to Jacksonville. Now, interesting how we stayed in Jacksonville, you know, we can have another conversation about that because we had a pretty big inflection point a couple of years ago mm -hmm. uh, when we decided to actually uh, extend our uh, extend our stay here. Well, I, I think that's super interesting. I mean, so the folks on our show and our audience here all either invest in real estate in Jacksonville or are thinking about it. And mm -hmm. when we talk about what the big drivers of why it makes uh, investment in real estate in Jacksonville such a, a good idea, we talk about the job creators, we talk about the economics behind it, right. but we've never really had insight into maybe into the, the headspace of the leaders of those businesses, those Fortune 500 companies who are making the decision to actually put their corporate headquarters here in Jacksonville. And it sounds like you've made that decision over and over again. We haven't talked about your new building yet. I'm sure we will, but I would love to hear maybe you, you talked about a point of inflection where maybe you had some other opportunities to go other places. Could you kind of bring us inside the closed doors and talk about those level of conversations and what ultimately made the decision to, to, to reinvest yeah, we, we, were, we were at an interesting inflection point when you look at where we're going to be headquartered. As I said, we have more than 75,000 employees operating around the globe. So, you know, with that, by nature, we're a highly distributed workforce. So it also means that, you know, we can move our corporate headquarters fairly easily because we just don't have concentration risk in any specific location. Mm -hmm. uh, although we do have a number of locations that have huge scale in them around the world. But when you look at it, as I shared with you, we had actually IPO'd out what now is known as Black Knight. And, you know, Anthony's board has just done a phenomenal job running that business and continuing to grow it. But at that point in time, Black Knight was continuing to grow and they needed space. Now, in our infinite wisdom, when we IPO Black Knight, I don't think we really thought about the building that we were housed in and the real estate ended up going with the with the IPO. So <laughs> we were actually leasing the structure, which is not uncommon for us. We lease a lot of commercial real estate around the world. Sure. But as Anthony started growing, he started expanding in other locations and he started expanding into Blue Cross Blue Shield. And so then you get a look at Pat Garrity and his group. And, you know, Pat's done a phenomenal job with Blue Cross and Pat needed to expand. And so Pat needed to get some of his commercial space that he had available that that Black Knight was taking advantage of. Black Knight needed some more space that I was taking advantage of. So that left uh, FIS kind of without, without a commercial real estate option. And, and so we started looking around. And then about that time, we did a major acquisition by anybody's definition. We bought, actually bought WorldPay that was uh, based in Cincinnati, Ohio. And it was mm -hmm. a $43 billion transaction. So, I mean, by anybody's definition, that's large. And so you're not going to trivialize that. And they, had, they were headquartered in Cincinnati. And so at that point in time, it was kind of an odd confluence of events. You know, we needed space. We didn't have space. Jacksonville didn't have the kind of space we were looking for. We just did the World Pay acquisition, huge presence there. Ohio was really interested in us picking up and moving the headquarters there or keeping the headquarters there and, 
and moving FIS there. And so that's when we actually started working, you know, with the city and with the state. And, but, you know, then it boiled down to where and, you know, could you even do it? And, and it really just came down to quickly a decision between Cincinnati and Jacksonville. And I have to give a lot of credit to Anthony Jabor and Pat Garrity because they did a lot to help us stay. I mean, you know, Pat had a surface parking lot that we needed, mm-hmm. you know, that was right on the river and was convenient for us. Of course, then he needed to replace that through a parking deck and the city rallied around that. And it just shows that it, you really can have a partnership between, and one of the things I love about Jacksonville is how engaged you can be with the various, you know, government officials. The mayor did a phenomenal job. Uh, you know, the state did a phenomenal job and just really rallying around and, and helping us try to craft something that would work. So Pat Gary was able to build a parking deck. You know, Anthony was able to extend his time with Pat to give us time to build a building on the surface slot. And, you know, the rest of the say is history. And so the incentives fell in the right position and we ended up choosing now Jacksonville for for the long term based on that decision, but it could have easily inflected and we could have easily just gone to Cincinnati given our position. That's that's funny that you mentioned Ohio because when I'm when I was preparing for this call, I'm telling Greg, I'm like, I'm sure Gary got the LeBron James treatment. Like he must have he must have been like wined and dined in different places and and off, you know, name up on the stadium scoreboard kind of thing, right? Type of stuff you see in a movie. And, and the fact that it was between us and Ohio is, is really, really interesting. Gary, I'd love to find out from you. You, you said that the packages came together and mm-hmm. the state, and there was some, there was a commercial real estate play. And clearly you have a network here of other leaders that you're tied to and, and the state and the city and all these different things that you got to collaborate with. But from, from your perspective in a, if you had a matrix of what you were evaluating, be it access to talent, tax rebates, right? Financial positions, you know, real estate pricing, stuff like that, right? Space in downtown, how walkable downtown is, things of that sort. Can you walk us through your decision-making process of what made the ideal situation, even even if it was just the fact that you don't have to displace so many people, right? But like, kind of what what were you weighing when you were, when you were going through those decisions of what makes the ideal home for a company like yours that has so many needs and so much. To- well, you know, you know, it, it, it's interesting when you look back on that. I mean, everybody would love to know that it's just one thing that gets done that makes it trip, you know, in a certain direction. The, the one thing I'd correct you on, the whining and dining's never, never a factor. And honestly, not something I even play in because sure. everybody can be whined and dined. It's really not even uh, important in my position at all. When you start thinking about talent acquisition, obviously it's very important, but you could also imagine a lot of people can rally with very large universities and very large fintech programs and very large partnerships. You know, city conditions matter dramatically, but just so, so you know, to be real clear, there's a lot of really nice cities where you can attract, where you can attract people. It does come down to really that combination of things. Honestly, you know, you enter into a position not wanting to disrupt the more than 1,000 employees you have here. It's not to say that we wouldn't have kept a presence in Jacksonville, but had we moved the headquarters, most of the functions that operate in our headquarters are just that. They are headquarter functions, right? They are large enterprise functions, and those typically migrate over time fairly quickly to where the corporate headquarters is located. So, even if we would have kept a presence, that would have dwindled just through natural attrition. So, so you know, you start out by saying, look, I don't want to move because, you know, you're busy doing other things. I mean, you're, when, you know, there's, I always laugh, what, you know, our, our goal is to grow into seven to 9% organically every year, produce margins around 45% and produce uh, mid single teens. EPS. And when you really boil that down, there's only seven companies in the Fortune 500 that make that claim. So our, our, our strategy is aggressive. Our growth is aggressive. Our focus is aggressive. So moving is a distraction, right? So let's just start there. So it does play a factor. Relationships do matter, right? Had, you know, Anthony Jabor or Pat Gary do not really rallied around that to try to figure out how to solve these problems with me, that would have mattered. 
you know, but at the end of the day, you also have to come down to a financial decision. You know, I have I have a lot of shareholders. And at the end of the day, it's not all about the ones and zeros. But the reality is you do have to take that financial calculus in mind as you're looking to where you're going to make a commitment. And, you know, we were making a big commitment. You know, the building the building actually cost uh, a little over $200 million to build. And so we're really leaning into that from an environmental uh, area and really wanting it to be, you know, extremely lead platinum certified. The list just goes on and on and on of the things we're doing. And we think we're making a unique experience. We were willing to make that commitment in Cincinnati as well. So, you know, that money can be spent in any direction, but it really is a combination of all that things that matter. You know, where are you on education? Where are you on talent? You know, where are you on, you know, downtown environment? Where, you know, is it a place that you can recruit to? And how's the, you know, as we recruit all over the world. So, you know, as we recruit for key positions, it's interesting, you know, oftentimes we're talking to people that aren't from even the U.S. I mean, we're talking to people from Asia that we're moving here, or people from Europe that we're moving here. And, you know, they check the box by knowing just the state of Florida, that might be the best scenario. And then you got to dial in on the city within. And so as you bring people in and host them, as you're recruiting them, join the company and moving them here, that type of opportunity and, and what they see from a quality of lifestyle is very important. You know, you mentioned Gary, the talent being a big part of, of the decision there. When it comes to FinTech, most, most people don't think of Jacksonville. Right. We, it's a talking point for us in our show to let people know that we are a leader in the fintech space and we've been growing so much. Could you share your thoughts on our talent pool here, specifically in the fintech industry and why that was such a, a positive for you to make that decision? Yeah, look, I mean, I think people don't, you know, it's kind of like FIS, you know, we're, we're a B2B company, so we're fairly unknown, right, in consumer ranks. So, you know, when you look at, look at our stock and how it trades. It's not a consumer driven stock. So a lot of people don't even understand what FIS is, but we're not the only FinTech here in Jack. I mean, I just talked about Black Knight's success. You look, uh, Dun & Bradstreet's in the process of moving to Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. You look, there's a number of really large key FinTechs in the market today and in Jacksonville specifically, large financial institutions have a large presence. So there's huge demand for talent here. The good news is Jacksonville is starting to become more and more a destination for that talent, you know, and as you think about it, we're getting, it's getting easier and easier to recruit people to the city because we're becoming more known. I think, you know, look, when Jacksonville last year was in the top 10 for destination cities in the country for people moving here. Now that creates some other challenges, you know, real estate, you keep talking about real estate, you know, look at what's going on in residential real estate. You know, it's it, it, it's it's going to start becoming an issue if we can't get ahead of that curve. Mm -hmm. And so, because when people relocate here, they're going to want a home. They're going to want a nice home. They're going to want to have, you know, schools that they can move their kids into. So all of this has to work together. And, and so far, the city's done a very nice job of keeping up with demand, but the demand's going to certainly, certainly accelerate. And it's not just financial technology. You know, I think last time I looked, Jacksonville was the fastest growing city in Florida. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of demand to move to the state. You've got a lot of great benefits from a tax standpoint on a personal basis. So there's all of these things that help. But, you know, the, the, the challenge is it's all got to work in concert. And so if we at FIS, which, as I said, We've committed to 500 new jobs. We've already added 250 new jobs and the building's not even open. So mm -hmm. just during the last 12 to 14 months, we've, been, we've done half of that and that'll continue to, to, to grow. But the interesting issue is, let's say that we end up getting, you know, we, we start running into a recruiting problem or a lack of talent problem or a housing problem. That list goes on and on and on. We'll recruit in Cincinnati. We'll recruit in Orlando. We'll, you know, so as a large company, we defer that risk by having a multi-location strategy. But ideally, what we'd like to do is grow grow as much of our talent here as possible. You know, you bring up so many interesting points. I wanted to make one of the connections there. The reason why, if I'm just thinking about as an investor or or the city of Jacksonville, the reason why it's so important to have companies like FIS here as our as our foundation is not just for the talent today, but it's to make sure that 
we attract the right talent for tomorrow. And ultimately, if you're a real estate investor, right, the fact that supply is low right now and demand is high is what's raising prices. But if you don't continue to raise median incomes, prices won't raise forever, right? So, so our, our job here as investors is to make sure that if we're thinking about the problems for today, it might be, you know, cash flow and return on investment. But the problems for tomorrow, 10 year, 20 year problems is how are we going to raise median incomes? That's why the city comes together to do whatever we can to make sure. And when, and Gary's talking about his other friends at other companies around here, well-established companies as well, they're changing their plans as well. It's because if we can make sure that everybody together here in Jacksonville is helping to bring the right talent in that, that median income raises Gary, I was doing some of the research yeah. before and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think with the 500 new jobs that you're adding as a part of the incentive package, those have an average salary, I believe of $85,000. Is, is that that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I don't have it in front of me, but that's not, uh, if anything, it could be a little higher than that after it's all said and done. I mean, these are really high paying jobs that, that are coming to the city. I mean, you know, we're bringing in, you know, computer engineers at significant levels. We're bringing in, you know, executives from around the world that are coming in. So yeah, I think that's, that's very if we're taking what Gary's sharing with us here and you're extrapolating it, how are you going to earn the best return on investment over the next full market cycle, full real estate market cycle, right? These types of jobs, these types of salaries today and continuing to grow that is how you manage your money effectively being in a place that continues to have that upward mobility of incomes is, right. is going to be more and more important in the future. Gary, how much do you, how much do you contemplate that stuff? How, how, how much are you thinking actively about the future of the urban core as it relates to your building, the millennial workforce wanting to have walkable urban environments, yeah. stuff like that. Do you, do you see yourself playing a role uh, in that development of this urban core here? And, and, and what is kind of your vision for it if you had one? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've already participated in uh, a number of engagements with the mayor and, and various groups here. You know, it's very important that we continue to revitalize downtown. I mean, we, we've committed, as I said, $200 million plus of just building our corporate building. We're doing a lot of things that hopefully we can utilize this structure, not only for FIS's benefit, but for the broader community's benefit after hours, programs, engagements. And we really plan on this being, you know, a very open facility to, to the community at large. I mean, you know, you hear comments about you can have problems parking downtown and we're going to be opening up our parking decks after our parking deck after hours and on weekends to provide that source of, of people access to the to the urban core, as you mentioned, but it's also important that we focus on, you know, safety, that we focus on the environment, that we focus on the walkability of the city. And as we recruit millennials, people are looking for access, right? You know, and one of the things I enjoy seeing, I'm enjoying seeing all the apartments coming up in the area, all the rental properties coming up in the area, but that's going to be very important because this next generation of talent that we're bringing in for these jobs they want to have that walkability. They want to have that access to restaurants. They want to have that access to entertainment. And that transcends not only during the week, but also on the weekend. So, so we're very involved and want to be more involved in that process. We've assigned a number of people at FIS to various committees that are at looking at ways to improve downtown. And that's going to be something that we're going to have to continue to strive for. So I'm, I'm very excited of all the things I see going on and, and hopefully we'll, we'll continue that in the, in the coming year. Gary, I just think about where your building is located there in the Brooklyn neighborhood, which is basically downtown Jacksonville. Yep. Think about just the change there over the last five years. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you go farther back, could you kind of talk to people about, you know, you being there and, and a lot of our folks on the show here haven't actually been there. Can you just talk about the changes that you've seen in downtown, maybe over the last five years to what you see right now and then what you expect maybe over the next five to 10? Yeah, you know, I think it's been phenomenal. I mean, I mean, if you look in, in the Brooklyn area there, you look along Riverside, I mean, it was, it really was in pretty, what I would consider in pretty bad shape at the time. I mean, when I moved here in 07, I, I rented a place because I was still living in Orlando and I was commuting while my daughter graduated, but, you know, they're in the Five Points neighborhood and, you know, it was nice. I could walk to work and it was great, but you know, there was just limited opportunity for restaurants and a little uh, limited opportunity for 
really uh, access of any kind of service. And if you look now fast forward, here's where we are. You've just seen explosive growth in apartment buildings, restaurants. You know, I think there's been a lot to improve the walkway uh, along uh, the river, which ends up, you know, just a great way for people to get around downtown, either Brooklyn all the way to downtown, vice versa. So green spaces have started to improve. You're seeing our building go up. You saw F and F build a really nice building. Let's not discount. I would argue that's the nicest YMCA probably in the country that's been built in, in, on, on Riverside. And you look at the impact that Eric Mann and those guys have made in 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 the downtown area. It's just been phenomenal, you know. But we've got to keep going. I mean, you know, I, I think when you look at, you know, we're we're talking about bringing in perhaps a light rail along Riverside and gaining access there. I think it's very important we lean into that because people do want to be able to get around the downtown area in a very easy way. And I think, you know, in many ways, Jacksonville had a lot of foresight and thought. But to me, the greatest thing, the greatest asset Jacksonville has is its downtown river frontage. And you complement that with its beach access. And there's no reason why Jacksonville is not the you know, the fastest growing city in the country, not not just Florida. And being and there's been a lot of examples that you can go back to that people have really rallied around their riverfronts and made just a huge difference. And so I think Jacksonville's making the right moves. We just got to keep doing that. Uh, and it's going to take, you know, private and public partnership to continue to make that happen. But you know, the whole Riverside Avenue is just a very dramatically different place than it was in 2007. And, and hopefully that will just continue. Interesting story that I haven't shared with you or really the show yet. So Brooklyn is the area that the, the FIS new building is. That's where FIS has been. Mm -hmm. And beautiful building. We're about a year out, I, I imagine, from from completion in there. Is that is that right, Gary? Well, I don't want to jinx it. We're a little yeah. ahead of schedule, but yeah, let's just assume a year out. <laughs> so 150 million, 200 million dollar building, 12 stories, beautiful. It's going to be in, in just an iconic building here on the skyline. So many wonderful attractions, amenities now in that Brooklyn area. It just wasn't there five years ago. So five years ago, a little bit longer than that, my business partner Alex, who's our president came to us and he said, hey, listen, I think Brooklyn's going to be on the up and up. And like Gary was just talking about, call it five years ago, Brooklyn did not look like it looks like today, yeah. right? And so he said, hey, we need to make an investment here. And my three business partners, and you know, we looked at him and we said, really? Like, this is not in our area here, right? We invest in below middle income neighborhoods, but not low income housing. Mm -hmm. and, and it was very much low income. So he said, we need to make a play here. And so what, what we're doing as a vertically integrated provider is, we're constantly making bets on areas that don't meet our criteria today for turnkey rental properties and property management, but we, we make those bets in advance to see which neighborhoods are be coming up to that standard. So we made a big bet in Brooklyn five years ago, and, and my business partner, Alex, has turned out to be incredibly right. Now, Brooklyn's just an, an incredible success story. And I mean, it's gone so far down that line that you have so many commercial players there really yeah. occupying the space. And, and, and so, and those, those types of things are things that we can do in the future too, right? Those aren't areas that we're able to buy today and then build new construction houses and sell them as rental properties and put great residents in there today, but you can make those types of bets. And then they turn out five years later to be just this incredible success story. Like Gary's making even bigger bet than we well, are. Right and, and look, I mean, you know, I, I can't agree more with you. And, and, you know, as you place those bets and as we commit to that area, you're now seeing a lot of follow on investment. I mean, we've got a brand new Marriott that's opening up. Right, it's going to be right in front of our building. That's going to be perfect as we bring in clients. I mean, we are going to have a almost a 30,000 square foot client innovation lab just in the new building so that you'll see a lot of influx of people coming in to visit that facility from around the world. And so there you've got a new hotel that's popped up. So it's advantage there. And then you've got access to a lot of restaurants in the area and continue to grow. And so I think you were smart in what you saw. We felt the same way when we were looking around. It was interesting. There were a lot of properties that people presented to us and said, look, if you stay in Jacksonville, you could go here, you could go there, you know, let's not worry about, you know, the Brooklyn area or the downtown area. And I was very clear in that. We've been there, you know, since the early 90s. And it just wasn't something that I was interested in doing because I've seen the commitment of the area. 
And for us, we wanted to double down in uh, the downtown area and take advantage of that. I mean, our, our colleagues are used to that commute. They've been coming there since the early 90s, many of them. And so just a real opportunity for us to make an investment as well. And so, you know, we've already talked about how we stayed, but even the real estate decisioning was very important for us because we just didn't want to radically pick up and move 20 miles away to some great vacant area that would have been, you know, easy to do. And so, I mean, Gary, if I'm putting myself in your shoes here, that's a tough decision to make when you made the decision to, to, to put the building, to, you know, to, to invest in the building. I don't know exactly when that was made, but yeah. many years ago, right. Your, your option at that point would have been to go to another place in Jacksonville, which was sure. not downtown, which would have you know, had probably better numbers, much better numbers that, that, that minute. And a lot of businesses have made that decision, mm -hmm. but collectively we all win so much more if we can make downtown work rather than to that's fractionalize right. it. So that's just, just a, a tougher decision to make, but such a long vision and, and, and a belief in Jacksonville long-term. Awesome. Very cool. Listen, I, for, for me, that Brooklyn area is kind of sentimental because it's got the one Venezuelan place in all of, in, in, in all of, uh, in all of Jacksonville. It's got that Arepa. Please, you ever been there, Gary? You ever uh, been across the street there? I have not, but I have, I've seen the location. So I've, yeah. I'm slowly covering all the restaurants in the area, but I, I haven't gotten to all of them. I love it. I, I highly recommend it. I highly recommend it. So we got a couple of great questions here coming in from, from our community. we got Denny Davis has a great question for you, Gary. He's asking, uh, he says, Gary, thank you for your time. Beyond the downtown revitalization, what, in your opinion, should Jacksonville and Duval be thinking about long-term, 10 to 20 years, that could be problematic if not addressed as Jacksonville continues to grow by leaps and bounds? You got anything on that? Yeah, I think we've got to continue. You know, look, you know, I, I think we've got to continue. And we've talked to the mayor about it. We've talked to various government functions around it. We've got to continue to lean in on education. Right. And we've got to continue to lean in on our public schools. We've got to continue to lean in on, you know, childhood education opportunities. We've also got like every major growing city, we've got to keep a watchful eye on crime and all the things that people look for when they relocate. You know, is it a problem in recruiting today? No. Could it be a problem? It could, right, in the future, like anything, but you never can trivialize the need to continue to invest in the infrastructure and try to stay ahead of that. You know, there have been times, you know, you're moving, so it's interesting, you know, you, you, you're born and raised in the Southeast part of the U.S. You're making a good living. Private schools just seem like a no brainer and, 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 you know, but you're moving from the Northeast, you're moving someone from New York. You'd be shocked at how many people don't even think about private school. It's all public school. Mm -hmm. So then public schools really do matter and the rating of those public schools and the ability to live throughout the Jacksonville area and still get uh, high quality public education. So you just can't get caught up in your box as you think about those things. And that's, that's what I try to uh, talk to everybody about who's, who's willing to listen on some of these topics. It's, it's not just about going to the beach. You know, we, we need great public schools downtown as much as we need down out at the beach and, you know, or whatever. We just need choice is the way I would say that. And so, so continuing to focus on that is important and uh, in making investments associated with that is going to be very important. Yeah. And we had, uh, we recently had uh, Gary Chartrand on talking about yeah. that choice mm -hmm. and the investment in yeah. education. So we're, we're, we're with you there. I got, I got one more question here from her Francois. He asked, and you may or may not know this question. You're probably at a, at a higher elevation than this, but based on the median income of your employees and attractive cost of living in Jacksonville, do you have any insight as to whether employees are renting or owning when you are recruiting people? You know, I think it's, a, I, I, I don't know the percentages, so I wouldn't be able to guess it. But I would tell you when, especially when we relocate people in that are well established in their careers, it typically starts with the rental that moves to an ownership, right? Because they're feeling out the community. They don't, they don't know where they want to live. You know, do they want to live on the beach? We always have this debate in the office. Well, you know, I live down, I live on the river. So, you know, obviously I'm biased towards the river. And, you know, a lot of people come, they think they want to be biased towards the beach. They just don't know. And so I find a lot, especially a lot of our executives will start with some type of rental and, and you know, just to feel out the community as much as anything. And then they quickly 
you know, within 12 months, move into some type of, you know, into an ownership. But so it's, it's a combination of both, but I couldn't speak to exactly, you know, the percentage. I will say it is generational based. I, I would argue a lot of our millennials that we recruit in, which today over half of our employees are millennials today. You know, I know a lot of our colleagues I talk to are renting it there in the Brooklyn area right, with all the growth in Brooklyn, and, and, and they're commuting to the beach on weekends, you know, and, and, and enjoying the beach on weekends, but enjoy the downtown lifestyle and, and some of the things they're doing there. So it's really a common. Just another way to connect all the dots of what Gary's talking about with the growth of downtown Jacksonville and some of the key metrics. Again, you know, downtown, one of our key initiatives is to get to 10,000 residents <clears throat> living downtown, right? This yeah. building, Gary's, you know, continued investment with FIS, you know, in this building, bringing 500 new jobs there, those people, if it, if it makes sense, why wouldn't they want to live downtown, right? If sure. it's a urban walking, walkable, thriving downtown area. And then Gary, there's the, the building, I believe you're actually going to house, I was looking at the numbers, call it somewhere around 1700 employees in the building, which is going to make space for Black Knight to continue to That's add right. employees, right? So we're talking exactly. about, yeah, we're talking about getting close to maybe, I don't know, multiple hundreds, maybe close to a thousand new folks that would probably love to rent downtown, which will help sure. the flywheel of revitalize, revitalizing downtown continue to grow, get to that 10,000. Well, with- I agree, Greg, and you haven't, you haven't asked this question, but I'll just add on to it. I mean, you got to also think about the new way of work, right? The building's going to be housing 1,800 people, you know, at capacity. Well, if you think about the new way of work, everybody's not going to return full time to the office. And so I talked about a lot of the amenities that were that we could hope to offer the broader city of Jacksonville to host events there. But you think about some of the stuff we're doing with cafeterias, what we're doing with gyms, what we're doing with, you know, we're talking about, you know, we were laughing saying we're going to do live music once a, once a week out on the out on the, the third floor patio that overlooks the river to, you know, engage. But you also have to realize everybody's not going to return to the office full time. So now it's not going to require 1,800 people to put 1,800 people in that building. It's going to take a much bigger number because, mm-hmm. you know, our, our new way of working is going to be much more in a hybrid format. So people are going to work three days a week, four days a week in the office. And so that then requires you to keep it fuller, you're going to have to actually hire more. And that's why I said earlier, you know, we're going to blow through the 500 number. And Mm -hmm. even though people do want that quality of life where they can have some flexibility in working from home, to your point, they still like that downtown community to be able to walk to work on the days they're going to be in the office and to have that flexibility. Or so I just think it's going to mean a lot of great, great things for, you know, downtown real estate and rental uh, properties and housing, et cetera. And you're starting to, and you're seeing that. I mean, you're seeing that growth all around the community. It's a phenomenal insight. I hadn't thought about that. That's a really, really interesting insight of the idea that we may be headed in a world of less commercial real estate, but that means more people to fill that commercial real estate because yeah. it is going to be modular. Mm-hmm. And Gary, yeah. you know, we want, we want to get you out of here early. You're, you're a busy guy, obviously, but we haven't asked you about your baby, right? Like you, you've talked, you've talked about this building, about it being lead platinum and being very environmental and all these cool amenities. Tell us a little bit, like give us, give us the whole vision of what the building is going to be and the spaces and what you're excited about. Tell us about the building, man. Yeah, look, I mean, we, we're, we're really excited about this new way of work and, and really leaning into that and really thinking about what are the amenities that our colleagues are going to want to see in the future. And so we're really leaning into a world-class fitness center. I think it's going to rival just anything in the area. We're talking to some people in Jacksonville to help us with that. But, you know, access to the riverfront and being able to exercise and promote a healthy lifestyle is very important to our colleagues. That is going to then translate into, we're taking an entire, pretty much an entire floor for our cafeteria and the kind of foods and healthy choices that we're going to have and access to outside dining. We built a stairwell that's going to connect from the third floor down to the second floor. And, you know, people are, even our colleagues don't realize that, but the stairwell is actually going to be lying for sound and it's going to be very wide so we're going to be able to have literally you know town hall meetings outside on the stairwell and almost an amphitheater type approach 
that's going to then feed into a world-class innovation lab and client briefing center that's all going to be down on the first floor. Then as you think through all the floors that are going to house our colleagues working every day, we're going to have some really neat coffee bistros on every floor and and opportunities, you know, all kinds of ways to meet in, in very unique ways. I mean, it's going to probably be the most technology advanced building. Now is it going to be the most energy efficient building? I would almost guarantee it's going to be the most technology advanced building in, in definitely in Jacksonville, probably in the state when it opens. Uh, the way we'll be able to do video conferencing, the way we're going to use online collaboration tools, because keep in mind, if everybody's only coming to the office three days a week and those three days rotate, that means at any given time, portions of those teams will be remote and portion of those teams will be in those meeting rooms. So how do you collaborate with those tools? How do you use collaborative whiteboard sessions? How do you drive the video experience so everybody feels like they're in the room, whether it's virtual or not? And so we're just really excited, leaning in hard on 5G and really pushing bandwidth in a very unique way to really just see that seamless interaction. So a lot more to come on it. You know, we're, we were laughing. We started polling with, with all of our colleagues and what they wanted to see. And believe it or not, pet care was way up there. So I guess a lot of people want to think about bringing their, bringing their pets to work. So wouldn't be surprised to see a dog, dog walkers in Jacksonville managing our colleagues so they can, so they can bring their pets. But at this point in time, it really is, we're still, we're still fleshing out a lot of these amenities, but we're real excited about just listening to what, what our colleagues want in the new work experience and bringing that to bear here in Jacksonville. Sounds like you, you building the business or building the building building the building took, it takes many years of preparation. It sounds like, you know, as you go through a pandemic in the middle of building, that would cause a lot of concerns about maybe how you originally thought the plans would go and how they've turned out. But it sounds like the building, the, the, the plan was already in place to be flexible, to listen to your talent, to listen to those around you at this point. So I guess my main question is, did, were there any missteps that happened because of the pandemic that you would have changed differently with the building or has it gone largely according to I, I don't, I don't think so. And well, I mean, you know, it's easy for us to say, let's, let's get it open and then we'll say whether we miss something or not. But, you know, we're leaning into, you know, healthcare concerns. We're leaning at, you know, touchless elevators. You know, we even thought about in the future, this building is going to be, as you said, it's going to reshape the skyline for decades to come. We started thinking about the future of commuting, right? You know, will everybody be driving cars in 30 years? We actually designed the parking deck where we could actually take that in and it become actually office space at some point in time. So we designed it with the intent that if we needed to ever bring that in because we needed more workspace, we could because fewer people are driving. So we really tried to stretch ourselves and think about where is the future of work going and how do we embrace that? And I think those decisions have held up well during the global pandemic. Obviously, we want to get the pandemic completely behind us on a global basis, uh, and we continue to monitor that. But we have we have reopened our office in Jacksonville on a volunteer basis, and we're at about 25% occupancy. You'll see us ramp that up in the coming months, and in September, you'll see us back to full capacity. But once we get open, I'm sure we'll have some lessons learned and some things, but Hopefully we design the business and uh, the building in a way that we're going to be able to pivot it fairly easily on those learnings and take advantage of. Absolutely fascinating, man. This was, uh, Gary, I, I want to get you out of here. I know, I know you're a busy guy. I want to thank our, you know, our community that's been part of this call for, you know, close to an hour now. We had 50 plus people here just coming to have the privilege to, to get to pick your brain. It's, it's really a, a privilege for myself. For, the, for those of you that came on the call and you want to get into the rental property game, you're looking for great property management, you're looking for an edge in the real estate market, next step is go to chatwithjwb.com to really talk about your situation and figure out how all this fits in. And right now we're talking about macroeconomics of what affects your rental income property in the real estate market here. And I, for one, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for what, what our conversation means to Jacksonville I, I, it's a privilege to get to speak to you. I'm going to give Greg last word here, but from somebody that, you know, I used to have a green building consulting company. I <laughs> like, I, I come from, I come from sustainable development and all the stuff that you're talking about of lead platinum and adaptive reuse for garages and indoor outdoor spaces. I'm like, 
super over the moon that you're thinking about all the stuff. And this is a reality of something that I used to work on in like 2005, 2006 as a concept. And to see that all this stuff is coming to fruition and that leaders of your ilk are contemplating this and, and that that future he is here of real estate is really, really exciting to me. So I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. And Greg, I'll, I'll leave you the last word. Thanks, Gary. You know, Gary, just wanted to say thank you again for being here. This is an incredible honor to have you here on the show. I know our community is just really blown away by listening to you, knowing all that you've accomplished. And I just think it's really cool for me. It's been able, I've been able to kind of take all, all of the amazing things that I've learned about FIS and with the new building and the commitment to downtown Jacksonville and, and the long term there, been able to kind of take that from the articles that I read or the conversations that I have. And it just seems seems real, but getting to know you on a personal level, it's been a real honor. It's wonderful to see that Jacksonville's key leaders believe as much as I do and Pablo do about our long-term growth and why this whole thing, connecting the dots really matters. And it's not just one company. It's not just FIS. It's a part of the bigger, the bigger flywheel that, that we're, that we're all creating here and, and that we all can win together. So again, thank you so much for spending time with us on the show and hopefully we'll have you back here some point soon. All right. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Pablo. Really enjoyed it. And you guys enjoy the rest of your week. You too. And uh, we'll see you all either in the Facebook group or on Thursday where we do the JWB Rental Legal Property of the Week. Week, 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 week. All right. See y'all, everybody.